Welcome to the next installment of the Miami Group Sierra Club Virtual Backpack Series. Welcome again to uh, our new year of Miami Group webinars. Uh, tonight, we're going to take a break from our uh, backpacking theme, which was pretty much all of 2020, and look at another great outdoor activity that uh, if you are into backpacking and camping, it leverages a lot of the gear that, uh, that you may already have and a lot of your skills. Uh, so let's get into the topic of the evening, uh, which is an introduction to uh, bicycle touring. Uh, we only have an hour this evening. Uh, so if you're new to, to bike touring, ho our hope is that we just give you a flavor of it and a general overview and just pique your interest enough that you're going to want to pursue it and try something. Uh, if you are experienced with bike touring, uh, we hope this is a good refresher, but we'd also encourage you to jump in with uh, your comments and your experience, because certainly, uh, you know, we welcome the additional perspectives. Okay, I'm gonna flip to the next slide. Uh, so we'll start off by just uh, introducing ourselves. Uh, Denise, you wanna start us off? Sure. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Denise Tingle and I've been camping, hiking, backpacking for 45 plus years. I am the hiking committee chair for the Miami Group Sierra Club, along with an instructor for the backpacking school. I also lead cycling rides and backpacking trips and my passion is backpacking and cycling. And of course, I just love being in the outdoors. Barry? Okay. Uh, my name is Barry Randall. Uh, my trail name is uh, Aardvark and I'm the uh, chairperson of the Miami Group Sierra Club outings. Uh, and we, uh, we basically schedule the, uh, the outdoor events. Uh, I'm, uh, have at least 50 years experience in camping, backpacking, that sort of thing. Um, not quite so much in bike touring, just that's a more recent addition, uh, but certainly have been on a number of those trips and uh, have some experience there. We have a few experts with us here tonight. Um, the one that's on with us right now is Don Hornberger. And Don, can you uh, do a quick introduction? Oh, well, uh, I've been a little bit opposite of you, Barry. I've done more uh, bike touring than backpacking. Right. Um, I'm an old time kayaker, whitewater kayaker, and uh, still like snowboarding and stuff like that. So I get out when I can, except I got a big boot on my leg right now from a foot operation. But uh, but otherwise, uh, I've been enjoying the outdoors since I was a Boy Scout. So here I am. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Sure. And then uh, I don't have her picture up here, but Nancy Ball is our uh, invaluable moderator who's uh, keeping control of everything in the background here. So thank you, Nancy. So let's start with, uh, with what a definition of bike touring is. So it it's, goes by many names, cyclone touring, bike touring, uh, bike travel, bicycle travel. Cyclo camping, I never heard that one, honestly, I got that off a website. Uh, bike packing is another popular one. But basically it's traveling on a bicycle for days or weeks or months on end as you cross cities or states or countries under your own power. Uh, typically it's an overnight activity, multi-day kind of event. And um, under one version, your gear and your food and your extra clothing and everything is carried with you, for you in a vehicle that uh, meets, meets up with you at various checkpoints along your route. And that's generally called supported uh, touring. Uh, or the other option is either alone or with a group. Um, all of the necessary equipment, clothing, food, et cetera, is all carried on your bicycle. So, and that's generally called self-supported. Both are great activities. Uh, both are very enjoyable. We're going to focus probably a little bit more on the self-supported version tonight, just because that's what our particular group has more experience with. Um, I'm going to flip to the next slide there. So uh, we're going to do a, a quick poll here just to uh, give you some thought exercise here about uh, maybe some, whether bike touring is gonna be something you're gonna enjoy. So Denise, can you launch that poll? Yes. Okay, so a few options here, just pick everything that applies for you. You know, love the outdoors, 
don't mind a little exercise outside, uh, like meeting, interacting with, uh, you know, local people, uh, can do your own basic uh, bike repairs, uh, enjoy history, like a physical and mental challenge. So we'll give you a minute there to fill some of those in. There is no right or wrong answer here, obviously. Okay, so high percentage of the people who uh, enjoy the physical and mental challenge, that's great because there's certainly a strong aspect. You know, the outdoors exercise, looks like a lot of people are interested in that. Uh, bike repairs, that's something that, uh, yeah, can be a little bit challenging. So that's something we'll talk about, but that doesn't surprise me. Uh, and the history aspect, you know, a lot of people interested, but maybe not everybody. So great. Um, you want to clear that, uh, Denise? <clears throat> All right. So why do we love bike touring? Well, a couple of reasons, right? Uh, beautiful scenery, healthy exercise, hang out with old friends, you meet new friends, a lot of interaction with uh, local people, a lot of historic interest, a lot of uh, roadside attractions, and uh, you know, you can do it either group, you can do it alone. So if you're into solitude, you can get that. If you're into making new friends, you can get that too. So flip to the next uh, slide for me, Nancy. So I'll, as I said in the introduction, I, I kind of came into this from more of a backpacking uh, perspective. And since most of our webinars up to date have been on backpacking, that's kind of the perspective that we're taking entering into this. So uh, I personally found uh, touring to be similar to backpacking in that it's enjoying the outdoors, it's great exercise, you know, the camping aspect, those kinds of things. But there are a few things that, um, I found a little bit different, which to me make it um, even more enjoyable in many ways. You know, uh, the first is you know interaction with a lot of locals. You know, by the nature of um, where these trails are located, you know they take you right through small towns and communities, um, and you know you can get some of that backpacking. You know. If uh, you think about the AT and some of the trail towns like Damascus along the AT, you get a flavor of that, uh, but you seem to get a lot more of it in bike touring. A lot of these uh, trails follow old rail lines, for example, which go through a lot of small towns. Uh, so if you're going to do this, you know, keep an eye open for local festivals and events. Um, we've been invited to annual town festivals. We've been invited to street dances. Uh, one memorable occasion, uh, we were invited to a fundraiser for the funeral expenses for a local resident. Uh, so, you know, there's just lots of ways to engage. Um, we were camping in a city park one time and uh, the mayor of the town stopped by just to say hi and, and welcome us to the town. Probably a population 50 or something, so I'm sure we stood out. Uh, but certainly an opportunity to really interact with uh, a lot of local people and, you know, share experience with them. Hey, Barry, uh, remember yeah. we even stayed in a horse stall one night. That's right. That's on our right. first KB trail. Local, the local uh, town horse stalls we slept <laughs> in one night. So... Uh, I mentioned a lot of these trails follow, you know, historic routes or, or railroads. Um, Natchez Trace is one that uh, we did, and that's the old um, trading route. That's the overland route of people who had brought goods down the Mississippi to Natchez and then came back overland. Uh, so a lot of historic history along that route. Um, the Katy Trail follows a good portion or portion of the Katy Trail follows uh, Lewis and Clark's uh, original route. So you'll plant past places where Lewis and Clark camped and interacted. So if you do enjoy history, uh, a lot of these uh, trails do have a heavy historic, historic component just by nature of where they were located. 
And finally, uh, roadside attractions, <laughs> just, you know, all sorts of interesting stuff, large and small. Uh, you know, we've got a picture of Crazy Horse Monument here uh, that the uh, Mickelson Trail goes past. And uh, the other little picture is Boat Henge, which is just some weird little off the beaten track, uh, you know, roadside attraction. So you're going to see a lot of that kind of stuff too. Okay. Uh, different types of uh, bike touring. Touched on that a little bit at the beginning, but um, there are all sorts of varieties, of course. Uh, guided bicycle touring is basically through a tour group, and that's where you are basically paying to be escorted. So someone's going to ride along with you. The route, the lodging, the meals, that, that's all taken care of for you. So that's probably the, the most expensive, but also probably the easiest way to get engaged in something like this. Uh, there's a self-guided version of that, which is basically everything's all planned out for you, the route and lodging and all that. So it's up to you to, to follow that route. <clears throat> Last category is the one that, uh, again, we've probably focused on, which is the uh, self-supported uh, bicycle touring. And that's where you plan the route, you plan your meals. Uh, you're typically, zombies a long van or something. Uh, but again, uh, we typically have enjoyed doing this as the uh, self-supported version. Okay. Flip to the next slide. Just an example of uh, some of the rides we've done, uh, the Katy Trail uh, in Missouri, uh, Natchez Trace that goes all the way from Nashville to uh, Natchez, Mickelson Trail, just absolutely gorgeous out in uh, South Dakota, Cowboy Trail uh, in Nebraska, uh, CNO Towpath, uh, Greenbrier, West Virginia, Great Allegheny uh, out in Pennsylvania and the North Brand in, uh, in West Virginia. So all different. Okay, it looks like we kind of lost Ferry there. So uh, I'll just go ahead and continue on without him. I am back if- uh... oh, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. I've been having some internet connection, but that was a quick, uh, quick recovery. You know, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to just ask here, uh, Don, maybe uh, you can chime in. What were some of your favorite rides and why? Well, for just a beautiful environment, would be the Mickelson Trail in the Black Hills. That was impressive and very just beautiful. Uh, and you even find out why they call it the Black Hills because those hills are so dark with the uh, trees and such. It's really outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed the uh, CNO towpath out of Washington, D.C. That was quite interesting. A lot of history there. Um, Katie L was beautiful. Natchez Trace was on the road mostly. It's a, uh, a road dedicated to uh, bikers, no, no commercial traffic. Uh, 45 mile an hour speed limit, super friendly to bicyclists. That was an exception. And uh, last but not least, the North Bend Rail Trail, 72 miles. Uh, Jeff and I, he's in the photo down there at the right. We did it in and out, but uh, it really gets, got you into the, shall we say, the back roads of West Virginia. Uh, you got to see how folks live right there. On, they used to live right there on the railroad track, but the track's gone because it's a rail, it's a trail. And uh, uh, that was impressive and, and heartwarming. The, the people were very friendly. And I just, it, each one of them has their own characteristics. They're beautiful. <clears throat> yep. Okay, great. Uh, we will be, uh, if you do have questions, enter them in the chat. But I, I did see one pop up there um, and meant to mention one of these trails is paved. The uh, Natchez Trace is actually a uh, parkway. It's a limited access uh, road. Uh, the rest of these, uh, I believe, are all crushed. Uh, at least all the ones I've been on are crushed stone. Is that correct, Don? Uh, well, the CNO towpath, uh, 
through Maryland and that was uh, uh, pretty uh, muddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or mud. <laughs> <laughs> kind of muddy because uh, it had rained a couple of days before we ever started and uh, 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 we knew we were going to be in for it and it was pretty grimy and muddy and you learn how to read puddles and everything else so you don't disappear. <laughs> so it was, it was an interesting challenge. And yep. that hooks, then that hooked up to the Great Allegheny Passage, which was crushed gravel and a lot of times black topped. So it was, uh, okay. one, that was one long trip that had two different kinds of surface areas. Yeah. And uh, Becky, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about bikes. And if you still have a question, just throw it in the chat and we'll catch it when we take a break in a bit. Okay. Um, okay. And so let's talk about bikes. Um, so the truth is you can actually use uh, virtually any kind of bike uh, on bike touring. Uh, but like anything else, like any other uh, outdoor kind of sport, uh, the more you do it, the longer you do it, uh, you'll find that there is some specialized equipment that's you know, probably a little better suited. Um, but it does depend also a bit on um, what kind of trip you're taking. So uh, how much are you carrying? Are you doing one of these supported trips where you really aren't carrying any gear at all? Or are you self-supported where you're carrying maybe 30, 40 pounds, maybe more of gear? Uh, and what is the trail surface? Is it one of these paved uh, like the Natchez or is it crushed rock or is it, as Don said, going to be uh, mud going through a swamp or something? So um, I remember when we were doing the, uh, the Natchez, we, we, stopped at a uh, rest area for lunch and there was a supported group that was also stopping there for lunch and their vans had pulled up and set up this uh, great lunch spread for them. Yeah. The guys arrived on their bikes. They're all on road bikes, right? Lightweight road bikes, just like my road bike, right? Uh, but they weren't carrying anything, right? They were carrying water and probably had a few snacks and maybe a jacket and that's all they had on their bikes. So, you know, they were doing this on a road bike, um, which is obviously going to be different if you're uh, carrying a whole bunch of gear. So the typical touring bike, and this again is probably more of the uh, self-supported where you're actually carrying some weight, is going to have wider tires, um, not necessarily uh, a mountain bike, uh, you know, heavy tread, knobby tires or anything like that, but they're generally going to be a little wider because of the weight and because you're generally going to be going over some rough surfaces. Uh, they often have a steel frame, again, because of the extra weight that you're going to be carrying. Uh, not necessarily true. There are certainly uh, aluminum touring bikes out there. Uh, they often have some uh, lower gears uh, for the hill work. Um, tend to be a somewhat more upright stance uh, just because the amount of time that you tend to spend in the saddle. Um, and they typically will have the built-in lugs for uh, a rack for panniers or, or something like that, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so a, a typical touring Uh -oh. bike is going to have some of those characteristics. But again, you can tour on any kind of bike. Uh, one that's pictured uh, here is uh, one of my bikes, and it's uh, inexpensive. It's, I forget how much it was. It was less than $400, certainly. It's a steel frame hybrid bike, nothing special about it. But like anything else, if you're into biking at all, you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars, however much you want on it. So uh, one of the links we'll give you later uh, does take you to one uh, touring website's uh, current review of uh, what they consider anyway to be the 100 best touring bikes. If you're... Okay, uh, let's see, you wanna to flip to the next slide? We're done with that. Okay, so uh, just in general, the gear, uh, assuming your trip is self-supported, uh, you know, this is a very high level kind of gear list, uh, what, uh, what kinds of things you would have. So, um, you know, a lot of this is typical camping kind of gear. Uh, some of it obviously is unique to bike touring. Um, talked about the bicycle. We'll talk about trailers and panniers in a, in a minute here, but obviously you have to carry this gear some way. Um, 
bicycle tools, obviously that's another kind of unique aspect of this sport is you are going to need the, uh, the basics of uh, some, uh, some tools to do uh, basic repairs. Some of the safety gear, helmets, lights, obviously that's kind of unique. And, uh, but a lot of it is pretty, pretty much what you would take on any camping trip. Uh, I, I apply the same principles to or in that I apply to backpacking. Uh, a lot about weight and how compact things are going to pack. Um, so uh, my gear. Okay. And you want to flip to the next uh, next slide. So I'll go ahead and take it from there till he comes back on here. So the next one is just a... Um, uh, a multi-day bicycle touring checklist um, and note that this list is intentionally just pretty much extensive but not all ri riders will need all these items. It was uh, a checklist suggested by REI and is a good starting point. Um, it's very extensive though and has some items for example spare spokes and tire that we would not typically carry. Now, I will say on one of our trips, someone did break some uh, spokes and ended up having to buy a brand new tire once we got to, to a bike shop, but um, that's very unusual. Uh, next one, uh, thank you, Nancy. So packing options, how do I carry all this? So as you can see, we have two pictures up there. One is with Kathy with her panniers, both on the front and the uh, back of her bike. And then you have Don here who has a bob trailer. So there are really only two major options for carrying gear on self-supported bike tour, either a backpack, but not recommended because you really can't fit a lot of things on there. Um, and it puts all the weight on your back and, uh, and really isn't an option for most people on long rides. And then you have a trailer, a tow behind the bike, popular brand is the bob, it's actually the beast of burden. And then the panniers or saddle bags attached to the rear or front of the bike or both. As you can see from the statistics, most people choose panniers. Although on our trips, it's more, it's been more like 50-50 between trailers and, and panniers. Whatever you choose, make sure you get out and practice some with a fully loaded bike before you trip. The extra weight will definitely affect the handling of your bike and take some getting used to. So how much room do you need? As a backpacker, I know how many liters of storage my backpack has, so I size my panniers to give me about the same amount. Um, and Don, maybe you could throw in there real quick for you, for your uh, trailer. Um, do you typically, I'd say you pack more than we do. Well, uh, can you hear me okay? I lost my screen here. Yeah, we have a picture of you in your trailer there. So I was okay. just asking, uh, yeah. typically, like, how much do you pack in your trailer? If uh, it's similar to backpacking, uh, you know, the tent, water, food, clothing, um, the, the typical stuff. Uh, in addition, I would be, you know, also have a toolkit and spare tube and, and bike maintenance items, as was previously shown, mm -hmm. and uh, and it. Uh, it's just to try to be efficient as possible and, and uh, just like backpacking, condense everything you can. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move on to the panniers and do the pros and cons. So some cyclists get along with only rear panniers. Pretty much that's what Barry and I do. And then we have a front bar bag. Um, and strapping some items like their tent and sleeping bag to the top of the rack. For longer trips, front panniers may be needed as well. If you use those, try to balance the weight front to back as well as side to side on the bike. Keep the weight as low as possible to keep your center of gravity low. So some of the pros is uh, they place the weight off the gear, off your body and onto the frame of your bicycle. They allow you to organize your gear into separate easy to access pockets. They can be waterproofed, although not all of them are. Um, they're easy to transport off the bike, like on planes, trains, boats, and buses. They make your bicycle very compact, which makes it easy to navigate narrow terrain. 
The downside though can only be used on bicycles when where front or rear racks can be mounted. And the price of the panniers range greatly depending on the quality. And also they come in different sizes too. Like mine were, were quite a, not quite a bit smaller, but smaller than Barry's and his were completely waterproof, but mine wasn't. Um, you can only use them on bicycles where front or rear racks can be mounted. The price of panniers range greatly, like I said, in steering a bicycle with front panniers takes some getting used to and learning to pack them correctly takes some training and they are difficult to carry for long distances off the bike. Um, but they're, they're convenient too, to like if you're going in a restaurant and you know, you don't want to leave your stuff on your bike, you know, they're small enough to carry in with you. Hey, Denise, this is, yeah. uh, I, I got back in. Thanks for, okay. uh, thanks for jumping in. But I did want to comment on the panniers that um, we have that one benefit. And th this is something we took off a, a website, a professional uh, touring website. Um, but uh, your bike is more compact, but um, I think Don's pointed out to me in the past that you're, you tend to be a little fatter. So it depends on what you mean by compact. So, you know, I personally like the panniers. That's what I use. But it does make your, your bike wider. Um, so um, it's compact, but it's wider. And then um, we mentioned the price range. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I was kind of shocked when I first started pricing <laughs> panniers. Uh, so I think it's worth um, shopping around and keeping your eye on Amazon and places like that for um, for a, a discount on the panniers because they can be quite pricey. So mm -hmm. you can keep going if you want, Denise, or you want me to jump in? If you want, go ahead and you can start with trailers. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, so uh, as far as trailers, um, you know, again, on our trips anyway, maybe half of us uh, use trailers. Um, as we mentioned before, there's there's couple of popular brands, but Bob seems to be one that has a couple of models that are quite popular. It can be used with any, really almost any kind of bicycle because it just attaches to the rear wheel hub. So uh, pretty much can be done with any kind of bike. Uh, you don't need any special uh, lugs or fittings. Uh, shifts uh, weight off of the frame onto that uh, rear wheel or wheels of the trailer. So take some of that weight off the frame and uh, presumably you could get away with a lighter, lighter weight frame. It's low to the ground, so a little easier to steer. Uh, Denise mentioned with panniers that it can be a little bit dicey learning how to steer. It's, it's not a big deal, but it does affect the steering. Um, Easy to pack, it's just one big container, right? So uh, like a backpack, very easy. You don't have to try and balance the weight uh, front and back and that sort of thing. Uh, they're almost always waterproof. Um, and I, I've heard they're better than panniers if you're in rough off-road conditions. And maybe again, that's because of the center of balance kind of thing. Um, they do add at least one or possibly two additional wheels uh, to the rig. So that's more friction, more resistance, right? Um, they're definitely not easy to throw on a bus or an airplane or something like that, <laughs> kind of a pain. Um, uh, you do have to typically carry an extra tube, right, for that smaller uh, wheel or wheels. Um, and you are longer. So you're, you're narrower like your bicycle, but uh, you're, you're longer. And I know, again, Don, you, you've been using a trail, trailer for years. Uh, anything missing here? I mean, obviously, you've, you've found it pretty easy to use. Well, uh, it, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest a two-wheel trailer. I'd stick with a single wheel, like the Bob trailer. It tracks perfectly behind the bike. And uh, you don't even know it's there unless you're going uphill. <laughs> yeah. and, and it does take a portion of the weight off of the back of the bike. Uh, because you're sharing it with the extra wheel back there. Uh, on our one trip, somebody had a problem with their spokes because they had panniers and a trailer, and it was he was really heavy, and it actually broke the spoke. I think Denise mentioned this before. It broke the spokes on his wheel, and uh, yeah. and, and, and the, the, if I recall, that trail was kind of rough in spots too, and that it just aggravates it. So uh, 
it does take some weight off of the off of the uh, bike, and, and that's that's an add-on. And tough to ship or something. Well, I did put it on a Amtrak train from Pittsburgh to DC, and uh, I used the box that it came in, and the the box that it came in that they shipped it to my house in the first place with the trailer when it was new was uh, uh, was a uh, 68 linear inches, you know, the width, depth, and height, like Amtrak and that. They always go by linear inches plus weight, and uh, uh, I think like Amtrak was your limit. You, you can't go past 75 inches unless you pay extra. So it, uh, you can box it to where it comes in under 75 inches and on Amtrak and maybe some airplanes, I don't know, and get by cheaper. So that's good. But yeah, they're, they're tough to transport for sure. I will say traveling with someone that has a trailer, a good pro for it is, uh, you know, if, if you pack everything up, and it's your first time going on a bike trip with these people and they have a trailer. If you talk to them real nice, like I did, it's like, hey, my tent stakes won't, my tent poles won't fit on my, uh, <laughs> on my bike, will you take them? The downside was though, that the person carrying them didn't make it to our campsite that night. So I didn't have a tent to sleep in. So luckily the, the teeny weeny town uh, had a, B and B, which actually turned out perfect because I got a shower and the other guys didn't. So, and a breakfast in the morning. But that is one thing if uh, you're pretty good friends with somebody that, has, that you're cycling with with the trailer, once in a while they'll carry some of your stuff for you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we'll have to add that as a benefit. You can yes. uh, dump your <laughs> extra gear on your friends that have a trailer. Right. Thanks, okay. Don. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Let's take a minute here. Uh, do we have any questions in the uh, chat room, Nancy? Yes, we do. I'm trying to trying to open them up here so I can go back and start at the beginning. Um, so Becky had asked about which which ones were paid. I think you answered that. Um, a comment from Nancy Watro says, "I took La Petite train La Petite train du Nord in Quebec." through the Laurent Laurentian Mountains for a week, and it was wonderful, half paved, half crushed stone. Um, uh -huh. And hang on a second here. So someone is asking about a hybrid bike working for all of the trips that were, all the trails that you had listed on one of the earlier slides. So my bike's the hybrid, um, and it, it worked fine on all those trips, uh, but it's a good question as far as what kind of bikes other people choose. So, Denise, what kind of bike do you have? Uh, same thing. They call it basically a, I'd say a gravel bike, yeah. something like that. Uh, my first bike was, uh, the first one I took on the KG Trail was, uh, I'll shoot from about 40 years ago. And I do remember the first time um, going through some of those posts that were narrow I was really scared I was gonna like not fit through them because of my pinniers. And it really took some use to getting used to uh, being able to coordinate that through there and ride it at the same time. So now I'm, you know, you're used to it. And the other thing is uh, some people do use clip, clip in um, uh, bike shoes and others uh, use just the pedal and regular cycling, you know, flat right. shoes. And uh, one yeah, thing uh... I don't have on my bike that would be handy is uh, at times is a kickstand. So uh, otherwise you just got to find a tree or something to lean it next to. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, difference in, you know, clip-on versus regular pedals. And again, I've seen both. Um, the, the other thing that uh, handlebars, uh, I have flat handlebars. I've never had a problem with it. It works fine. Mm -hmm. um, most of the sites that I visit on bike touring, they seem to recommend uh, drop handlebars. I think for the same reason that they are so popular with road bikes is it just gives you a lot more positions to put your hands so that your hands and arms don't get as tired when you spend a long time. Uh, biking, but I've never had a problem with the flat handlebars that yeah, came either. with my hybrid. So. I know, Don, you have a touring bike pretty much, right? A trek. Well, well Denise, I, my first two lengthy trips, 
Uh, I used a, a full-blown mountain bike. It was a rock hopper, a specialized rock hopper uh, with two-inch knobbies on them almost. And uh, it did okay uh, because what's what, the difference on the bikes is marginal. If you're carrying a load, you're not going to be looking for speed. You're looking for, you know, just being able to carry the load and go. Right. And uh, so it kind of equals out a little bit between a mountain bike and a, and a hybrid, uh, yain mainly because you're just not in a big hurry. Okay. So Nancy, another question. any other? Uh, yes. Yeah, any others? Um, yeah, so this one might be for Don. Uh, There's a question from Holly asking how the bob impacts the bike, uh, the handling of the bike. A uh, couple of different ways. Uh, it, it's a nice low center of gravity. Uh, the bike handles just fine. Like I say, you, you, on the flat and, and, and such, you don't even know it's there. Uh, you can't quite turn as sharply with the trailer as you can with, uh, without it, but uh, it's, that's never been a problem. Uh, it's narrow, so it does go through cattle gates or overgrown trails with side obstructions. It slips right through there because the, the trailer loaded is pretty doggone narrow compared to panniers that are sticking out to the sides. And uh, uh, the scary part, I guess, is if you go too fast downhill. <laughs> uh, I think you're not supposed to go over, excuse me, not supposed to go over 25 miles an hour with the thing because it will start, if it's not loaded real well, it'll, it'll, it'll wig leg like any trailer that's uh, tongue light. So, uh, but uh, not too many times that I want to go more than 25 miles an hour. So, <laughs> so otherwise I kind of like it, but yeah, it, it's, it's tough to, uh, to ship it or pack it. So uh, that's okay. cool. But it worked. So but then it worked. also, so also Barry, maybe this will be something you, if there's time at the end, um, CS mentioned that he made panners um, and that it wasn't very hard. So maybe if there's time at the end, he can fill in a, yeah. some information on that. And then a um, couple more questions. So uh, this may be something you're going to get to. I'm not sure. Chuck is asking about, uh, he says he's curious about finding campsites. Um, and then also ask a ask about using uh, the, it just says trailer support with a couple I think maybe he's asking if that's like how well that works or if it's recommended okay well we'll talk a little bit more about uh, lodging camping that sort of thing coming up and uh, um, tell you what uh, for the sake of time because I want to make sure that we respect everybody's time here um, why don't we hold those and see if they're covered in the upcoming slides and if not at the okay. end when we open it up We'll okay. Jump, jump all right. Cool. Okay. We have several more, so we'll just hold on to all this until we get there. Okay. 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 Food. So backpacking foods are a good choice for cooking in camp. We usually plan our bike food similar to backpacking trips. So number of days we need to carry between resupply points. And also you keep in mind that when you're planning your trip, like are there grocery stores generally available, but plan ahead. Many of the smaller towns no longer had stores or restaurants, breweries, wineries all make a nice break and you get to talk with the locals as you do that. So as you can see here, these are a few pictures from, um, from the uh, Nicholson and Nicholson trail that we did uh, last year. And there was a saloon that we stopped up to that I'm pulling up to there now. And uh, they did have lunch. So we, you know, sometimes you get a nice surprise where you get to, to have something unexpected. Same with the Thai kitchen that happened to be at a campground that you would have never expected for something that good to be there. So, uh, but yeah. So the other is shelter. Um, You'll have lots of options, traditional public and private campgrounds, city parks that are open to cyclists for camping, cyclists only, campgrounds provided by the trail organization, hostels, much like you would find on the AT, bed and breakfast, often with garages, et cetera, to accommodate cyclists and hotels and motels. And again, a lot of this you find out as you're planning your trip, um, like what the accommodations are gonna be, uh, what a, you know, is there food, those kind of things. And also an important thing is where are you going to be able to store your bike? Preparation and skills. So you should know how to check out your bike before the, the bike trip. Um, and if you don't know how to do it, then definitely it's a good idea to take it to a bike shop and have it tuned up. 
and know how to perform uh, basic trail side maintenance, such as install a new tire, replace a flat tube with a new one, patch a bike tube with a patch kit, adjust front and rear brakes, install new brake pads, adjust the height and position of both seat posts, saddle and handlebars, install front and rear racks if using, attach your trailer if using, clean your bike chain, adjust your front and rear derailers, and install, remove your pedals. And if you haven't done these things before, uh, take a hands-on class. I'd say the majority of our repairs um, on our trip so far have made, other than the spoke on that one, uh, has been flat, um, not so much anything else. Anything that you can remember, Don, that would be more drastic? Mm, I think uh, Kathy might have had a trouble with a, uh, brakes and gears a little bit, but it was solved on the, on the trip. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And her derailer broke. The derailer yeah. had to be replaced, actually, yeah. by the side of the road. So, yeah. <laughs> And the police car actually gave him a ride into town and back. Yeah. Friendly. Uh, so planning. So as you start to look into where you want to go and what you want to do, you establish uh, a few things, daily mileage, consistent with group's capability. So again, like, is everyone in your group can they only go five miles a day versus 10, 30, 40, 50? Um, obviously, this will depend on your group's physical capability and also how much leisure time you build in, plus the type of trail and whether you're carrying a full load of gear. And of course, the weather. On the Natchez Trace, uh, we did 40 to 60 miles per day. And again, remember that was not, that was a paved road. On the Mickelson Trail, we did 30 to 40 miles per day, and there was a lot to see. And in fact, we all agreed that if we did that one again, we would we would take a full week at least to do that one. Um, trail guides are available for most major trails. These are an invaluable resource. Some trails have online communities that will answer questions and help you plan. Check with local resources on current trail conditions. Sections of the trail may be washed out or detoured like our Nicholson Trail was. And check with the local Chamber of Commerce or the governing organizations such as the National or State Park Service. Identify food and water resupply and camping, lodging, stops, and identify bike shops along your route in case major repairs are required. Potable water can, can also be an issue on remote trail sections. So again, check with local resources and, and know how far in between, just like backpacking, are you going to be able to get fresh water? So how much would you have to carry, which also adds weight to your bike. Uh, arrange a shuttle or plan for self-shuttling. If using a shuttle service, contact them well in advance regarding availability and prepayment requirements and follow up closer to the trip to make sure all plans are in place. In addition, you know, they'll always want to know what kind of gear you're, you're carrying so they know if they have a trailer that's going to accommodate all your, all your gear, such as a trailer, etc. Um, and make sure your bike is thoroughly checked out and practice with loaded gear. We recommend a shorter shakedown trip before a big trip. For example, maybe you take the Little Miami bike trail up to Yellow Springs and camp at Jam James Bryant and then return the next day. And that would give you a really good indication of uh, how to handle your bike, et cetera. So um, on this slide, we have a couple resources, uh, organized bike tours, general bike touring intro, bike touring tips, and top 100 touring bikes. Those are some uh, useful ones. So now uh, we'd like to ask you, how did we do? We hope this presentation got you interested in trying bicycle touring. So this concludes the presentation, but hang around for a few minutes. Uh, and so uh, I'll launch number the next uh, poll. So you, you want me to launch it? Uh... Or you got it, Denise? I got it. Okay. So um, while you're comp completing the last poll, I'll mention again that uh, we will post a PDF copy of this presentation on the Sierra Club website. And within a few days, we'll post a link on the same page to a recording of this webinar, along with responses to any questions we didn't answer for you today. We'll have a live Q&A at the end of this presentation and one we'll mute you so that you can ask your questions live. 
While you are thinking about your questions, I want to let you know that we will not, we will host a few more webinars at least through February, if, which are already posted on the Sarah Club Meetup. If there is a particular topic you'd be interested in, please use the chat box to let us know that as well for any future ones. And in March of 2021, of course, we're tentatively planning to begin this series of the backpack trip uh, school that we did again. So if you missed any of our early sessions, you'll have the chance to fill in some, some blanks. So let me go ahead and end that polling. If you love the outdoors as much as we do, we'd love to have you join us exploring, enjoying, and protecting the planet. Some easy ways to do these are become a Sierra Club uh, member, make a donation, join our meetup, and become a volunteer. We will place a link in the chat box to the page with a PDF copy of this presentation, and you can download that to access these links. And lastly, if you're already an experienced outdoors person with skills to share, we would love to have you join us on the outings committee. We are looking for outings leaders who have a passion for sharing their experience with others. Right now, we are doing this virtually through our webinar series, but someday we'll be back out on the trails and waterways in person again. The outings committee has a lot of fun. Consider joining us. This presentation has been brought to you by Road Rivers and Trailers, our local independently owned outdoor outfitter in Milford, Ohio, by the Miami Group Sierra Club, a part of the country's largest grassroots environmental movement, and by the Summit Trek and Travel, your connection for adventure travel. So again, we will begin our uh, live Q&A in just a moment, but for those who have to log off now, it's been great to be with you, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in two weeks by Brian Wolf. We will be hosting a great presentation on multi-day backpacking trips on the Appalachian Trail within reach from the Cincinnati area. Again, thank everyone for joining us and um, our live and Q&A is now open. Note that if you choose to ask a question, your video will appear in the recording of our session tonight. If that concerns you, please turn off your camera or ask your question in the chat. If you have questions you'd like to ask your panel live, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand in the participant box. Everyone take turns answering questions and whenever all questions are finished. Again, we wanna thank you again for joining us today. Don't forget that the link in the chat box will take you to the Sarah Club page where you can find handouts from the presentation and a list of upcoming webinars. It's been a that pleasure link, for all of us. That link will be there in just a moment. I'm pulling it up for you all now. Okay. Okay. So the questions uh, that we didn't finish uh, doing, I think, Chuck, we um, might have uh, hopefully answered your question on the campsites. Um, you did. And trailer support a couple. Don, if, you're, if there's two of you going, would a trailer support all your stuff uh, for two people? That would depend on how long you're going to be gone, because uh, in a lot of these situations, you got to take you know, food, water, and and, uh, uh, and some extras. So it just depends on how long you're gone and how compact you can be when you're packing and how efficient you are. And uh, maybe, yeah, I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to say though that uh, you know Jeff's not here, so I can take his name in vain. When I when I looked at the amount of gear that Jeff was carrying. <laughs> That could have supported a family of four. Right. <laughs> so I think it is possible. You can put yeah. a lot of stuff on those trailers. You may not want to, but right. you can. Yeah. And Chuck, I will say that Jay, um, that does do the other gentleman that's with us, that uh, his wife comes. So he has the trailer. He also has rear panniers. In addition, his wife has panniers on her bike. So for them, they don't fit everything on the trailer. They they do need additional panniers to to fill their stuff. Um, will they like the to cook. Yeah, they do. Um, will the trailer fit on a bike rack when transporting in a car, Don? Uh, you'd have to rig up. Some, you're if you're talking about a bike rack that's behind the car, like on top of the trunk or behind the hatch. Uh, you'd have to rig up something if it's possible you could or you can put on the rooftop if you got a rooftop rack. Uh, you just have to engineer it a little bit, but it can be done. 
Um, do you tour only trails and how do you find routes? Uh, I found quite a few new ones on Rails to Trails, the magazine Rails to Trails um, is a good start, wouldn't you say, Don? Yeah, I, I, there, I certainly would. I, I recommend Rails to Trail. Um, it looks backwards. <laughs> Rails to Trail, yeah. uh, the organization. And yes. uh, they're very helpful and a lot of good information. Okay. Uh, and if you start by Googling uh, bike tours, you know, you'll find a number of sites. And, you know, we gave a couple of them on that uh, link page. Um, and then we'll list some popular rides. Um, and there are a lot of uh, touring companies, too, that um, will advertise, you know, fully supported rides. But you don't have to do it with them. Obviously, you can just steal their route planning. <laughs> and then uh, do it yourself. So, you know, if you look at some of those sites and some of these resources like Rails to Trails, um, you'll find a lot of lot of options. And once you narrow it down to a couple or one that you're really interested in, you'll often find a, a website from some, you know, Friends of the Katy Trail kind of organization that actually um, uh, will have a lot of information on their website. I know for the Natchez Trace, uh, when I planned that one, some guy out there actually has a website and apparently it's just his thing to help people plan trips. So you tell him how many days you wanna spend, how many miles you wanna do a day, your starting point, your ending point, which way you're headed north or south, and he'll actually give you a trip plan, you know, free of charge. So. You know, there's a lot of groups out there like that who support these these trails and are very willing to help you out. Hey, I want to interrupt for just a second, if you don't mind, Barry. I just want yep, to mention, so the, um, the link on our website that takes us to the PDF presentation of tonight's webinar appears to be broken. I have put it in the chat box anyway, um, and I'm, I feel pretty confident that that will be fixed by tomorrow. Actually, what it's saying is that we don't have time to view it, or we don't have permission to view it as a preview. So I think um, we probably just need to have a switch from a preview to a live. Um, hopefully that'll be taken care of tomorrow. <laughs> so um, I, instead of putting the link just to that one, I put a link to the page that lists all of our webinars. So if you scroll down that list, you'll find, and you may find other ones you're interested in, you can check those out as well. We have uh, videos of almost all of them on those links. Uh, but the one for this particular one for bicycle touring is on the page that I put the link in the chat box to and hopefully it will be active tomorrow. So I apologize for that. Okay, Thank thanks. Uh, another one, Barry, uh, someone mentioned that, um, where'd it go? Uh, all trails, uh, there's a, something like all trails that they use and it's called trail link. That's kind of similar to all trails, but for biking. Yep. So that's yep. one we could do. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, uh, just in general, um, you know, just like there are websites and apps for planning a backpacking trip, you know, mapping it out, figuring out the mileage and all that, there are there are sites where you can do that for bicycle trips too, and so that's a that's another good resource where you could actually lay out, particularly if it's a like a road trip that you're just constructing yourself, not an established trail like, uh, you know, the CNO or Katie or something like that. So there are resources like that where you can basically map out your own trip. Mm -hmm. um, another one is, uh, okay. I see uh, one here asking. Go ahead. Any Sorry. benefit to putting your backpack on your Bob trailer and being able to take it with you off trail? Yeah, you can do that if you want to. I mean, there's no, no restrictions on that. So if, if it works, go ahead. And any comments about adventure cycle routes? Hmm. I'm not familiar with uh, adventure cycle uh, routes, uh, Frank. I, I think you had mentioned that in an email at one point. Um, I mean, it sounds like a interesting outfit. It's a, it's a company or an organization, is that right? He might be muted. Yeah, it might be muted. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm not personally familiar with them. Everyone think, should have the that, ability to unmute. By the way, if you yeah, are muted, you should be able to unmute yourself. We took the. We changed the setting for that. 
Another one, are touring trips still possible if you if you do not want to camp? Oh, absolutely. Totally. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It would be actually kind of cool to do one like bed and breakfast to bed and breakfast or something mm -hmm. like that. I know, Denise, you'd love that, right? <laughs> you <laughs> get a shower every night. night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and maybe Nancy would even go on that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, I, I like that's... camping. <laughs> I do like to cycle. I do like these trips. However, it is nice to have a shower. Um, but, you know, on the Natchez Trace, which was very hot. Uh, sometimes you just have to make do and bring your own little shower curtain and <laughs> stand behind it and somebody pours water on you. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Let, me, but, let, me, let me add this though, on a, on a CNO trip and a GAP, uh, no showers were very handy. So I, I, I take pride in the fact that I took a river bath in three different rivers. I think it was the Potomac, <laughs> the Allegheny and the Yakagany. <laughs> there you go. Anything's possible. Go. Yep. <laughs> but yes, it's definitely possible to do this uh, without camping. Uh, absolutely very possible. There were there were alternative lodging, I would say, most places. Now, we did plan most of our trips around camping, so we kind of factored that in. Uh, but probably half the places we camped, we could have stayed in a, in a bed and breakfast right. or a motel or something. But I'd say the most enjoyable thing I think for me is not only just being with my friends, but just the unexpected uh, things that would happen that were good things, like when we stayed in that city park and then they happened, happened to have a picnic, they were having a town picnic that night and then a dance afterwards and down the street yeah. and they closed off the street and it was just just a lot of fun and they just treated you like you were part of them it was yeah. just great and it, it was neat yeah, to, paid five to, bucks for a, or whatever it was eight dollars yeah. for a for a you know home cooked country buffet i mean it was just uh you run into that kind of stuff and it, it's really hard to predict but really very memorable yeah a lot of fun I see one more comment. I think it's a, it's from Chuck. At first, I thought he was describing a medical condition because he says something about having a super itch. But <laughs> I've been surfing all all winter. I've been surfing a set of outfitters who do the Allegheny Passage, and I've just been watching one where for thirty dollars a day they give you a bike with panniers, a patch kit, and a pump, and then for about a you can choose how many days you want to do. You can set your mileage. And for about $110 a day, they will cart you from trailhead to a room and carry a suitcase for you <laughs> and provide you with breakfast. Oh, come and on, Chuck. You're a backpacker. Don't tell yeah. me you need oh, this. Yeah. Can you, and, but that would bring all kinds of different people in. You know, it would be a diverse group. It would just yep. be, it just, I just been looking at that all winter and all Sounds COVID. like fun. Hey, Don, can you just say a little bit about your trailer when like the cowboy trail that we did where we had unexpected larger pieces of gravel um, and then, you know, where we really had to go off the road quite a bit because of the detours. Well, and how did that impact you as far as riding your trailer up those hills, et cetera? You're talking about on the uh, cowboy trail? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was a, a unique trail. It was, it's in Nebraska, so it's dead flat. <laughs> and uh, uh, in a lot of places, uh, it was uh, crushed rock or stone and that, but a lot of places it was almost uh, too porous and you would sink down and make it hard to make headway because uh, it was so loose. I, I used to tell myself I was in search of the hard pack, looking for something that's harder on the trail that's compacted down so you don't sink a lot. And that was a bit of a challenge. But the, the fun part of that one was, you know, we talked about the uh, Mickelson Trail up in the Black Hills, so beautiful at the, at the hills and, and all that. But then you go to the uh, uh, Cowboy Trail, it's dead flat, and you're out there, and you don't, you're out there by yourself. I mean, you're out there, nobody's around, but there's a highway not too far away, but you're just going along, and you can't tell you're coming to a town until you look on the horizon. You see, the first thing you see is an antenna, and the next thing you see is the water tower. Then you know eventually there's a must be a town there. And then you bicycle, you know, eight or ten miles. And you, yeah, I'm here in this town, you know. And it's just a whole different atmosphere. The variety on bicycle touring is just 
it's tremendous. E each trail is, once again, I said it before, it has its own characteristics. You'll come away with something different on every one. Okay. All right. Any other uh, questions out there? I think we're a little over our time. I think that's it. No, that's it. All right. All right, great. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. Really appreciate it. Uh, great questions. And uh, keep in touch. And please join us uh, for our future webinars. And hopefully get out there and uh, meet all you in person at some point. So right. have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.